Hi everyone, welcome back to the University of Guelph Arboretum. My name is Michelle and I'm the summer naturalist here at the Arboretum. And today is a pretty hot and sunny day. And on days like today, on really hot summer days, sometimes you'll go out and about in a walk in nature and you find yourself searching high and low for animals and you might come up a bit short. And this has to do with on really hot sunny days, animals are doing usually their best job at keeping a lower profile, expending less energy, and trying to find a cool place to beat the heat. And while watching animals in their natural habitat is an awesome way to learn a little bit more about that species, it's not the only way to learn more about an animal. If you study an animal's bones, you can learn a whole lot about what kind of animal the, those bones belong to and the kind of life that animal lived. And that's exactly what today's video is gonna be all about. We're gonna be taking a look at some bones from animals that you can find right here in the Arboretum. So let's check out some of those bones. So here in front of me, I have a few skulls from a few animals that you can actually find right here in the Arboretum. And the reason why I've chosen to look at skulls specifically rather than looking at other types of bones is because there's a whole wealth of knowledge that you can gain by studying an animal's skull. So let's take a closer look at some of these individual skulls. One really cool piece of information you can gain by studying an animal's skull is you can learn a whole lot about what kind of food that animal ate. And that's because different animals have different diets and these animals are actually pretty well adapted and evolved to consume their particular diet. So when we take a look at, let's say this skull, for example, this will be the first skull we check out. We can take a look at its dentition or the teeth that this skull has to learn a whole lot about the type of food this particular animal ate. And so there's a few things you can take note of when you're looking at an animal's dentition. You can note the type of teeth this skull has, their general appearance and how they're arranged, as well as you can also look at the number of teeth this skull has. But if we start up front, you can see that right here, these are the incisors, followed by some canines, and then there's molars back here. And so first off, we can note that this skull has those three type of teeth. And when we take a look at all of the teeth in this skull, they all generally have a very sharp appearance to them. These teeth look perfectly designed at piercing and shredding flesh. And that's because this skull actually belongs to a carnivore. This skull belongs to a fox. And we know that fox live here in the Arboretum but they're an animal that you don't typically see out and about during the day. So studying an animal's skull is a really neat opportunity to learn more about an animal that you might not have the opportunity to see in your day to day. Now, if we contrast this skull to a herbivore skull, so let's take a look at this skull. If we take a look at its dentition, we'll quickly realize how different these skulls are. So first off, when we look at the front of this skull, we'll notice that there's no teeth here. And you can see there's no incisor, there's no canines. Instead, this skull has a lot of molars here at the back of its skull. And instead of having more of a sharp appearance to them, these molars are actually very flat. And that's because this animal, this is a deer skull, and deers are herbivores. You can oftentimes see them munching away on vegetation. And so you can see just how well adapted these teeth would be at grinding down on vegetation. And there's actually a whole lot of different implications that come with the types of food different animals eat. In general, meat is easier to break down than plants. And so carnivores tend to have a more simple digestive tract. Herbivores on the, others, on the other side of things, 
plant matter, because of some of its components, are generally harder to break down and digest. So these guys tend to have a longer and more complicated digestive system in order to break down and gain nutrients from plants. A lot of herbivores will also have uh, symbiotic relationships with bacteria in their digestive tract in order to help them break down some plant matter. And if we continue to look at different parts of this deer skull, what's really cool about a deer skull is you can see up front at the top of its skull, there's these two rounded bases. And this is actually where the antlers that deers, male deers tend to have will grow. Typically it's the males that have antlers, but in some cases females have grown them as well, which is pretty interesting. Generally, male deers will use their antlers for mating. So big, beautiful antlers can show off to a female that this particular male is really fit. It's a, it would make a really good mate. So they can use their antlers to show off to females. And they can also use them when males will sometimes fight over dominance in order to breed with a particular female. So they can use those antlers in those mating fights. And in some cases, a deer can also use its antlers for protection, but they generally are used for mating. And so antlers are a type of bone that just grows on top of a deer's skull. And it has many interesting uses. Uh, and so it's really neat to see that its skull is perfectly designed to grow those antlers. This is where those antlers would grow out of. But now we've taken a look at a herbivore skull and a carnivore skull. What would an omnivore skull look like? So omnivores are animals that will eat both meat and plants. And this raccoon skull, I think, is an excellent example of an animal that's an omnivore. And when you take a look at an omnivore skull, so here we can see it has incisors, it has canines, and it has a lot of molars. Canines are generally an indication that this animal ate meat. And you can see that this raccoon skull has a variety of different types of teeth, and that's because it has a varied diet. So omnivores will eat both plants and meat, but they can't generally survive on just one type of food. A raccoon couldn't grow up its whole life only eating berries. It would need to get some nutrients from meats that would usually fill its diet. So omnivores tend to have a variety of different teeth that allow them to eat a varied diet. But what about animals that maybe don't have teeth at all? So far, I've showed you guys how interesting it is to study an animal's dentition, but what about a skull like this one that maybe doesn't have any teeth at all? This skull belonged to a crow. And so while it doesn't have any teeth, it still has a lot of cool adaptations to help the, the crow eat the particular diet that it has. So crows also have a very varied diet and so their particular beak is designed to help them eat a variety of different things. Different birds will have differently shaped beaks. And so some beaks might be really sharp and good at sh uh, shredding flesh, maybe for birds that are carnivores. And other beaks, if we think of, let's say a tropical bird, for example, they might use their strong beak to break open nuts. But in the case of a crow, a crow has a very, very, a very, very diet. And so their beak allows them to eat a lot of different things. They can eat insects, berries, um, nuts even. And so their, their particular beak is designed in a way that lets them do that. And one of the reasons why birds don't actually have teeth is because the skeleton system of a bird is very focused on being light. A lot of the bones in a bird's skull are filled with air instead of being filled with bone marrow. Uh, mammals' bones are ten tend to be filled with marrow and birds, a lot of their bones are filled with air and they're hollowed. And that's because for a bird to fly, it takes up a lot of energy. And if a bird's heavy, that's even more energy that it has to expend. 
So birds use a whole lot of weight reducing mechanisms in order to keep the amount of energy they need to expend to fly as low as possible. Teeth and our jaws tend to be a very heavy part of our skeletal system. And so in order to cut down on that weight, birds use specially designed beaks instead of teeth and they use lighter bones to keep themselves light enough in order to fly. And birds aren't the only animals without teeth. You can also think of a turtle. Turtles don't have teeth. And again, instead they use, a lot of turtles will have a beak instead, and they can use strong jaws to bite down on whatever it is they tend to eat. So be that vegetation or flesh, turtles can use their mouths and a lot of turtles will do an excellent job of swallowing food in bigger chunks. They don't need to chew as much. And so they have different adaptations to eat the things that they want to eat. Other bones, other animal skulls, I don't have one with me because they tend to be very difficult to keep intact. But if we think of a snake skull, snakes have this really awesome ability of opening their mouth quite wide in order to eat their prey whole. The dentition of a snake's mouth, of a snake's skull, it actually doesn't have the same purpose of if we think of this fox skull. So we can see all of the teeth in this skull would be excellent at shredding and tearing flesh so that this fox can consume its meal in multiple bites. A snake's dentition, on the other hand, is filled with a lot of little bones that would actually do a very bad job at sh shredding and tearing flesh. And that actually forces snakes to consume their meal whole. They will eat everything in one bite. And to help them accomplish this, their skull, instead of, again, if we look at this fox's skull, the jaw is one solid bone and the top of the skull has many bones that are pretty heavily set together. And so this jaw moves in, two, in one piece right here. The lower jaw moves up and down and there is a restricted range of mo movement because this skull is very heavily set and isn't made up of multiple pieces. A snake's jaw, on the other hand, is actually made up of multiple small bones that are linked together by very flexible ligaments and tendons. And this allows the snake to open up its jaw far wider than a mammal can open up its jaw. Part of the role and function of bones in our skeletal system, they have a lot of very important functions. They give us structure, they protect important organs, and they help us move because bones are the attachment point for various muscles, ligaments, and tendons that allow us to move our bodies. So in a snake skull, instead of having a set of larger bones, they have a bunch of small bones that are linked together by flexible ligaments and tendons that allow a snake to open its mouth wide open. And because its teeth don't allow it to shred and tear its prey apart, its bones and its skull that allow it to open wide uh, will allow this snake to consume its prey whole. So there's a whole lot of information that you can learn by studying an animal's skull. A lot of it has to do with what that animal ate, but learning about what an animal eats can tell you a lot about how that animal lived its life. Another thing that you can do with a skull is actually identify a skull to a particular species. So in biology, there is a hierarchy of classifying organisms into various categories that become more and more specific until you identify an organism to its exact species. And when we take a look at this skull, we can actually do just that. We can categorize this skull into various categories until we get right down to its species. And when we again look at its dentition, a very important part of studying an animal's skull, this one is really unique. In part because of its brightly orange colored incisors. 
So these incisors look so much different than let's say this omnivore's incisors. Here you can see the raccoon incisors are much smaller. It has more incisors compared to this skull's incisors. These are really big, they're orange, and there's only two of them. And then if we open up its mouth, just like the herbivores in molars, it has very flat molars that would be excellent at grinding down vegetation. And so these, this dentition is quite unique. And these front teeth is actually a very uh, unique characteristic to an order of animals called the rodents. You might be familiar with rodents. And so by looking at the dentition of this skull, we know we can classify it to the order of rodents because of its front teeth. Rodents have very large and unique front incisors that are used to gnaw and chew on hard surfaces. These incisors will actually grow for the entirety of an animal's life. And so it's actually important for an animal to use its incisors. It's important for a rodent to use its incisors and wear them down. Otherwise, they'll grow so long it becomes problematic for the individual. And so we think, now that we know that this skull belongs to the order of rodents, and we know this skull belonged to an animal that lives here in the Arboretum, we can start thinking about what rodents live here in the Arboretum. So there are mouse and squirrels, porcupines, muskrats, and beavers. These are just some rodents. And so right off the bat, we know this doesn't belong to a mouse or a squirrel. It's so big that this, this is larger than a mouse itself. It's far too big for a squirrel. So we can very easily, just looking at the size and the shape of it, cut those animals out of the running. And so now we're left with some of the larger rodents like porcupines, muskrats, and beavers. But again, this skull is so uniquely big that we can, with a lot of certainty, say that this one, this skull belonged to a beaver. Beavers are one of the largest rodents here, really anywhere in the world. And so having such a large skull with unique features uh, allows me to identify this skull to a, a beaver. In certain cases, if you're looking at a skull that maybe is close in size to other animals, counting the exact number of teeth and how they're located can actually help you identify it to its species. Animals that are in the same order and might look similar will also at times have different number of teeth. There are also various landmarks along the skull that you can use uh, to help you identify that skull to its species. But I think identifying a skull to its species is just one part of the puzzle. Learning a lot about what that animal ate and how it lived its life, in my opinion, is even more interesting. So if you ever get the opportunity to find a skull when you're out exploring nature, take a moment to observe its different unique characteristics and maybe try to guess what animal that skull belonged to and the kind of life that's that animal lived. I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little bit about some of the bones and animals that live here in the Arboretum and I hope you join me next week for another video.